Good morning, everyone. So let's get started back in chapter 12. Let's start back with this problem from last time. I want to talk about a few things just related to questions like this one here, where we're comparing boiling points. So one of the things was that our hydroxyl group, or the OH group here, instead of an NH2, we have the more polar oxygen, so that makes for a more polar molecule for a stronger hydrogen bond. So both the hydrogens attached to nitrogen and the hydrogen attached to oxygen lead to hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is the stronger of the three types of intermolecular forces that we've talked about be, be between dispersion forces, which is where we induce a dipole moment. That's the only force of attraction in things like CO2 or N2. So that's the attractive, only attractive force in nonpolar molecules that don't have built-in charges. We have the dipole-dipole force of attraction. This is the force of attraction we see in molecules that are um, polar. So the molecule has to be polar. And then um, we also then would have dispersion forces. So we would have something like dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces in something like HCl. Then in something like HF, where we have H directly attached to NO or F, then we have the H bond. So here we have the dispersion force, we'd have the dipole-dipole force, and we'd have the H bonding intermolecular attraction. The H bonding intermolecular force of attraction isn't because necessarily there's hydrogen in the molecule, it's because there's hydrogen attached to a really small electronegative element, giving a really high partial negative and partial positive charge on small atoms that then leads to strong attraction to an adjacent molecule. So the hydrogen bond is this bond right here. It's that intermolecular bond between two adjacent molecules of HF. It doesn't refer to the bond in HF itself. Like this bond here is still just a covalent bond. So that's not the H bond. The hydrogen bond is the intermolecular bond between two molecules. And so that force of attraction is the strongest of these three. So the hydrogen bonding force of attraction is the strongest when you're comparing comparable size molecules. Um, as you just grow in size, as a molecule that's on the nonpolar side only has that dispersion force, as the molecule grows large, the boiling point can become quite high just because the molecule has a big enough size. Because this dispersion force is directly proportional to size kind of in two ways. If you remember, having more atoms for the same size was better than having fewer atoms. So like the noble gases was, were bad because they have all their mass in a small space. If you can elongate the space with more atoms, that's better. So more atoms for the same size or just a bigger atomic weight. So having a longer chain of carbon atoms, for example, would be better. So in terms of boiling point, if we're looking at our boiling point trend, CH4 would be less than ethane, would be less than propane, would be less than uh, butane, et cetera. So if we keep adding to our carbon chain, we're adding to the boiling point um, of the hydrocarbon. Things like octanes are in gasoline that are in liquid form. So we know that once you get about eight carbons, you're solidly in the liquid phase uh, for your substance at that point. So your boiling point's increasing due to the increase in the dispersion force. So you can have a strong intermolecular force of attraction without having a dipole-dipole force or an H bond. The molecule just has to be really big in order to have those intermolecular forces to allow high enough attractive forces such that you have a liquid at room temperature. Um, and so then on a question like this, then gets into branching. So branching is bad for uh, boiling point and for intermolecular attraction. We saw an example with pentane straight chain earlier in the notes versus a branched version of the compound neopentane. So we looked at the straight chain, had a higher boiling point, stronger force when you have two linear molecules of pentane as opposed to when we had that neopentane, which looked like having three CH3 groups attached to a central carbon still has the same formula of pentane, which is a different arrangement, that this was worse for intermolecular attraction. So having uh, the structure branched was worse. And so we have a branching point here. So the branching point weakens the intermolecular attraction, but we still have five carbons. So one, two, three, four, five carbons for, for C, but the same thing for A, one, two, three, four, five. So having a branched pentane chain uh, weakens the intermolecular attraction in that stronger hydroxyl group. So the OH group, the uh, oxygen's more electronegative, has a stronger hydrogen bond than the nitrogen. So our two oxygen groups, probably higher boiling points than the two ammonia-derived groups. 
the two NH2 groups, and then the one that's straight chain would be higher in boiling. So I just wanted to talk about that again. And then I want to talk a little bit about how, what's that? Sure, yeah, so the structure of C, uh, I don't know why I circled it, um, the structure of C, let me uncircle that, would look like having a carbon, CH3, CH3, and then a hydrogen as well, and then attached to another carbon with a, a hydrogen, oh no, that's this, a carbon with two hydrogens, so I'm just interpreting CH3, two of them on a carbon, also with a hydrogen, CH2, CH2, and then the OH group. And then let me draw one other version of the structure too, and I can contrast this with A as well, is that these groups would all be tetrahedral, and it doesn't matter so much where you put the hydrogens versus CH3, but you would have like a tetrahedral carbon, because we have four bonds on that first carbon. You'd have your second carbon. Let's put hydrogen, hydrogen here. Then you'd have another carbon with hydrogen, hydrogen, and then finally that hydroxyl group. So one, two, three, four, five carbons. And so we're just interpreting that CH3, 2. So here's the two CH3s, that CH group, CH2, CH2. And so the key is that this is a branching point compared to structure A. Yeah. Is the NH2 on the end also branching? Uh, not exactly. I mean, the NH2 is just really the polar end of the molecule. So that's just like the, the, the polar group where we're judging the hydroxyl to be more polar. So stronger dipole-dipole force for the hydroxyl group, stronger H bond. And it comes down to a little bit of, um, at the end of class, where we were talking about how ammonia, um, so the boiling point of ammonia is less than that of HF, which is less than that of water. If you just look at the boiling point trends, this was like on a previous slide too, you can glean this information. And now this here is a little bit peculiar because water is higher boiling than HF. HF actually boils right around room temperature um, despite having that strong intermolecular force of attraction, that hydrogen bond. But the issue for water is it has two hydrogen bonds to having that second H bonded to. It actually makes oxygen having two groups pulling towards its charge makes it um, almost as negative in charge as fluorine is and it picks up that second H bond. And then ammonia you might think would be really great for this because it has three of those hydrogen bonds pointing in towards nitrogen, but not as great of a negativity difference. So I don't think we could have predicted this trend, but we could maybe explain it through having a small electronegativity difference between N and H, and then having a relatively high enough difference between H and O to really extra polarize that oxygen to make it have the highest of these three. And so then that kind of goes into the ammonia being weaker here, the, the nitrogen hydrogen bond being weaker than the um, the alcohol group hydrogen bond. And so then this is just straight chain here. So if we're picturing the structure of A, we're just picturing you know, a CH3, CH2, 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 and then the hydroxyl group. And I don't know if you need to really picture that three-dimensional structure, but it might help you to think that these molecules do have those tetrahedral groups. So we do have these tetrahedral groups that you can sort of picture if you wish. You'll see these a lot more next year if you take Chem uh, 2510. Um, so, but you can probably appreciate these tetrahedral carbons as alternating, but a straight chain structure, stronger forces. So you can have two adjacent molecules get that much closer together, push their electrons around more easily, be more polarizable as a result. The branching point then weakens the force of attraction in C. And so the weakest here, if we said which of these probably has the lowest boiling point, would be that one with a branching point. So the lowest would be D, in terms of the lowest boiling point. Because we have then that weaker, the nitrogen instead of oxygen, and then we have the branching point, lowering that boiling point. Yeah. That kicks in, like, uh, like if you just add to the carbon count, that makes things hard to compare. Like, if you add a branching point but add a CH2 group to it at the same time, you can't, it's harder to compare. So when you're comparing structures, 
it's important that we compare the exact size if we can. So when possible, we want to compare the exact same size molecule. So if you add a branching point, which we can structure, then you add to the chain, which adds to the dispersion force, it's hard, it would be hard to, to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, like what we're comparing there is the same structure, but we're adding to the carbon chain. So we're just going from the shortest chain to a second carbon, third carbon. So we're going in terms of like the carbon, we're just going from one carbon to two carbons to three, four, five, six. You know, so each time you add a carbon, you're adding to the dispersion force. So each added carbon is additive to, so that the, the adjacent molecule, when it's longer, has a stronger attractive force. So if you go to a shorter molecule, so if you only have like propane, something like this, that'd be too tight. You got propane, second propane on top, weaker force because there's less carbon chains. So if you're comparing like nonpolar molecules have the same structure, a bigger molecule better. If you're comparing a long chain, straight chain hydrocarbon with a smaller branched hydrocarbon, it becomes hard to compare. Like so you have to sort of have as close to an apple to apple comparison as possible. One of the recitation activities actually kind of made a mistake in a way, or I, I made a mistake, of um, having the two carbon chains be of different length, but it wasn't, like if you make this carbon chain longer here, then it's still higher boiling. So that's kind of one of the recitation examples. You'll, if you listen to the video, when the, um, the final activity is made available, you'll hear me go, oh crap, I kind of screwed up the, the formulas, but you can still determine the right answer. So if I make the chain in A longer, that just makes it even higher boiling. And that was another thing I wanted to talk about today. Um, in fact, let me do this on a new slide. This is cluttering up here. Is just kind of compare water, which has a boiling point of 100. Like, what about methanol? Because methanol is really the same structure. It's just we replace a hydrogen bond with a group that doesn't hydrogen bond. But then it's also bigger. So I don't know if you could predict if this is going to go up or down in terms of boiling point. But it goes down. It's about 64 degrees C. And so again, I don't know if we can predict it, but I think it makes sense though once we see it. We can, we can sort of understand a trend once we see it. And that's a lot of what goes on in this chapter is kind of saying, well, I don't know what the trend is. Let's look at it, try to understand it, and then try to see, OK, so losing that H bond, so water having two hydrogen bonds, is what made it sort of better than HF. So losing that second H bond is probably going to weaken that intermolecular force. Well, what do you think about this? This I think we can predict. Should this boiling point go up or down compared to methanol? So from 64 degrees, I add to the carbon chain, should my boiling point go up or down, and why? It should go up because we're, we're increasing the dispersion force. So we look at all these molecules here, all three of the molecules, and all molecules in general have a dispersion force of attraction. All molecules have that are polar, like these, have dipole-dipole force. And then these, because of the hydrogen attached to oxygen, have the H bond. And so from water to methanol, we're losing the H bond. So we like lose H bonding force of attraction, we lower the boiling point. From, um, from methanol to ethanol, about the same hydrogen bond strength. We have the same oxygen to hydrogen, so that H bond strength doesn't seem like it would change by much. So the H bond strength for, from methanol to ethanol, what we're doing is we're adding to the dispersion force. So if we add to the carbon chain, we get an extra addition of dispersion force of attraction. The boiling point becomes about 78 degrees C. So then you go to propanol, and it continues the trend. So this is about 90, I think 7 degrees C is the boiling point here. And if you go to butanol, and it's like 117 degrees C. You know, so we're adding to the dispersion force. So you can add to the dispersion force just by adding to the nonpolar chain of the molecule. Um, let's actually look at propanol to one propanol. Or, or excuse me, to isopropanol. So isopropanol would have this formula. We'd have the hydroxyl in the second carbon instead of the, the first or third, which is really the same. So this version here is often called 1-propanol, um, or N-propanol sometimes. And this one here is called 2-propanol. 
we had introduced a little bit of the naming, but didn't have to like learn the, the number naming system of alcohols back in chapter two. So you might have remembered seeing a couple examples of this. But so this would be on the second carbon, so that's why this is two propanol, but different molecule, different properties. But do you think the boiling point goes up or down? And then why? Straight chain. So linear chain's better for intermolecular force. The boiling point actually goes down. It's 88 degrees C for, is for isopropanol. So we drop that boiling point from 97 down to 88 due to branching. So we can even pick up that problem of branching when we branch the, the alcohol group and put it up here and involve the molecule instead of having a straight chain version of the molecule. So branching weakens intermolecular forces even with that hydrogen bonding force of attraction being moved around and sort of branching the structure. So I just thought that was interesting that you can kind of see the property even in something like one versus two propanol. Okay, now again, I don't think you'll see these examples again. These are just examples to try to show us the impact structure has on properties. And if anything you get from this, it's understanding structure is really important because then you get that connection to properties. And that's almost ochem in a nutshell, is organic chemistry is a structure of all different kinds of organic molecules versus their properties. And it's also how you synthesize and do reactions with these compounds too, so it's more than just their properties. But once you start to gain the, the sort of understanding of different types of functional groups and how they interact with molecules, you can start to picture organic molecules in a whole different view. I don't know if you'll be as happy about that after OCHEM next year, but that's kind of the, it's just the branching. It's, it's, so the difference is if, you're, if you have a chain of carbon atoms, it's a question of do you put the hydroxyl group on the first or do you put it on the second? And then the third is the same as the first. So these are the only two possibilities for propanol. So do you put the hydroxyl group on the second or on the first? And then do you saturate then the other positions with hydrogen? So this would be, you know, hydrogens in all these positions here for the first one. So that would be the one propanol. And then two propanol, the hydroxyl on that second. And we again saturate the carbons with four bonds with hydrogens on the other positions. So they one has to give me not only the propanol, but they have to tell me two propanol. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't think they're gonna you're not gonna see this example again. So let's move off of this. You know, like this is going too much into detail on something that is useful to see because structure and property go hand in hand. And that's the whole point of this chapter, I think, is just trying to understand that the polarity of molecules goes hand in hand here, right? So that if a molecule is nonpolar, then it doesn't have that dipole-dipole force of attraction ends up having a lower boiling point. Let's take one other detour real quick. SF4, that's not an S. Um, so compare these molecules real quick, SF4, SF6. Um, we saw these back in chapter eight. And in chapter nine, we were looking at their, their polarities F and their structures, then their polarities. So SF6 was the one that was octahedral. So you probably remember this structure here. You probably remember six plus 42 for 48 electrons. That's the wrong count. Yeah, yeah, six for salt for 42 for the fluorine, six times seven. So 48 total electrons. So we have this octahedral structure. And so hopefully you, you recall, and you probably can appreciate these dipoles canceling out on the axial <laughs> positions here, and this molecule ends up being nonpolar. Um, I should have brought some to class. I hate doing this dumb. I did it once, and I don't think I'll ever do it again, is you breathe SF6 in, because it's nonpolar, you can breathe it in like helium, it makes your voice deeper. Um, so kind of, instead of helium making your voice high, it makes you sound real deep. But, um, but anyways, compare that with SF4, where you have six, plus 28 electrons for 34 total. You probably remember this is the one that had that goofy uh, seesaw structure. So where we get this extra lone pair here with lone pairs around all the fluorines. And so again, you probably remember seeing these structures here, but one of the key properties for SF4 is that it is polar because it doesn't have that opposing fluorine where instead it has that lone pair. And so the boiling point of the smaller SF4 is actually higher, so the boiling point of SF4 is greater than SF6 because of that dipole-dipole force of attraction. Um, and so the, from the two properties, you may think just increased size usually increases the dispersion force, increases boiling point, but SF6, though, being nonpolar, doesn't give it that dipole-dipole force of attraction. So we get the dipole-dipole force here, 
dispersion force, and then versus just the dispersion force on SF6. And, and again, like, I don't know if you could predict this. Like, you could compare these, you can see one's polar, one's nonpolar, you look up their boiling points, and it just turns out that the boiling point of SF4 is higher than the boiling point of SF6. You know, meaning, I don't think you could predict would the addition of a little bit of dispersion force from two more fluorines from having more mass counter the dipole-dipole force of attraction? I don't know if you can predict that, but the dipole-dipole force is greater, showing you that there is you know, a, a reason or um, a um, um, sort of a relationship between polarity and structure, and a, a, and a relationship between that structure of the polarity and the property of the molecule. So properties go hand in hand with structure, as I hope what you are gaining from, from these examples. Preview of OCHEM that you guys have to come. What's the difference between and So let's kind of look at this example here. So which substance here can only exhibit the dispersion force of attraction? So this question is, this is just a fancy way of asking which of these molecules is nonpolar? Because nonpolar molecules only have the dispersion force of attraction. Polar molecules would have dipole-dipole forces, and then polar molecules with hydrogens attached, attached to oxygen can have hydrogen bonding forces of attraction. So can we agree HBr is polar? Just because bromine and hydrogen have a difference of electronegativity, there was a weird, you guys just finally got to see midterm three, so if you haven't had a chance to review your midterm three, take a look at it, you can see your answers and, and the key. But all diatomic molecules that are, have polar bonds are polar molecules. That was a weird question on the test. If a molecule is diatomic, two atoms, and we have a difference of electronegativity, then the molecule has to be polar. It's when you have more than two bonds, you have to think is the molecule situated in such a way that we have a difference of electronegativity. And for structure one, We'd have two chlorines and then two hydrogens. This would be tetrahedral. You might have a Lewis structure that looks like this. If you're sketching out the Lewis structure of one, you might have something that looks like this. This was kind of also on midterm two. I think something about dichloromethane being polar or nonpolar was on the test. And you might look here and think that these bonds oppose each other. But they don't oppose each other because this isn't the real three-dimensional structure of dichloromethane. The real structure is tetrahedral. Those chlorines don't oppose each other. They're bent relative to each other. They're 109.5 degree bond angles relative to each other. And so we do have a negative side of, side of our molecule. We do have a positive side of our molecule. We'd have a polar molecule. So CH2Cl2 is polar. Um, so it would have the dipole-dipole force of attraction in addition to the dispersion force. And then C and H don't differ much in let's negativity. And even if they did, we just have a bunch of these tetrahedral carbons, you know, so that they don't really situate themselves in such a way to pick up a polarity difference. So three would be nonpolar, kind of for two reasons. One, a bunch of tetrahedral groups that don't really differ much in electronegativity because we have hydrogens all the way around the molecule, but also the CH bond, not very polar. I would just think that the CH bond itself is nonpolar. It's, it's sort of that electronegativity difference is not great enough such that the molecule picks up, or that bond picks up a polarity difference. So the only one here that would be polar is two. Or, well, that's actually, <laughs> okay, the only one that's polar is two, but the question is asking for the ones that form dispersion forces only, which would be one and three. So the dispersion forces are the nonpolar molecules, one and three. So I answered the wrong question. So I was circling the answer for the polar molecules, but the question is asking for which of them are nonpolar. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm circling, I'm crossing out the wrong answers for the wrong reasons. So two is polar, so it's not the answer. One is polar, so it's not the answer. So it's only three, yes. My brain is non-functioning at this point. So yeah, only three is nonpolar, thank you. Okay, so then there's a couple properties that then have relationships to intermolecular forces. One of those is viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of the resistance of a liquid to flow. And so the stronger the attractive forces in a liquid, the, the, the closer 
but the molecules can get or the stronger their attractive force, the more likely they're gonna be a solid. And if you have a solid, it's not flowing at all, right? So like a, a solid would have no flow at all. A liquid would have some sort of a flow, so the stickier the liquid is, the less likely it's going to flow. So our viscosity is going to be directly proportional to the strengths of intermolecular forces of attraction. You strengthen the forces of attraction, you strengthen the resistance to flow. You make it harder to flow. Okay, and so viscosity becomes higher when the substance has stronger intermolecular forces. And so then you can look at having different chain carbons, so going from hexane, heptane to octane, so adding to the carbon chain. As we go down here, we're adding to the uh, carbon chain, we're adding to the size of the molecule, so we're adding dispersion force from top to bottom in this trend. And notice that the viscosity is increasing. So we add to the dispersion force, we add to the viscosity. Okay, so anything that increases intermolecular forces increases the uh, dispersion force. So if you think of like a molasses, a molasses is a long chain of like sugar molecules that have those strong hydrogen bonding um, um, hydroxyl groups of the sugar molecules. So you have a long chain of molecules that have really sticky hydroxyl groups, and so molasses really resists flowing due to having those strong intermolecular forces of attraction. Yeah, yeah, the boiling points would follow that same trend too. So boiling points here would follow the same trend of increasing. So hexane to heptane to octane would increase in boiling point. So the, so the boiling points would increase with the same trend. And same thing with oil. I think oil is much longer chain hydrocarbons than even on the previous slide. So like an oil would have really long chains of carbon atoms, which would resist flowing to a greater degree than having shorter car carbon chains. Um, and so then if you start thinking of like an oil having really long chains of carbon, um, that's where you get much stronger forces even than water. You know, so if you think water doesn't really resist flowing, it um, flows pretty readily. Um, and so the, the, the issue there would be that, um, that even though water has that strong hydrogen bonding force of attraction, you would need like a longer chain molecule to pick up even more intermolecular forces of attraction. Yep. Okay, so another property is uh, surface tension. So that's the energy it takes to break um, a, a surface. So what's shown in one of these pictures here is sort of water. Um, the hydrogen bonding nature of water does make it fairly hard to break the surface of water. So insects um, can sort of sit on top of water and not break the surface due to the strength of the surface of water. And so um, the inward force that has to be applied to break the surface is related to that surface tension. And so the stronger the intermolecular force is, then the higher the surface tension. So surface tension is directly proportional to intermolecular forces, just like we saw for viscosity. So the stronger the intermolecular force, the stronger the surface tension. Um, so if you replace water with maybe some sort of hydrocarbon or something that doesn't have as strong of a force between the molecules, probably easier to break the surface. One thing that this even comes back to the resistance to flow, but I used to remember like we would have these big, when I was in grad school, I'd have to fill up from a 55 gallon drum of acetone into like a bucket. And instead of it flowing, it would, it would almost like drop straight down. So you'd have droplets like kind of falling off and not flowing because of the um, lack of a resistance to flow due to the weaker intermolecular forces in that substance. But anyways, um, another thing is capillary action. So capillary action is the sort of meniscus you get with water in like a test tube. It's how water travels up a plant stem. And so the issue here is, well, what's the attractive force in water? You have H bonds, dipole-dipole force, et cetera. And in the glass itself, you would say, well, what's the intermolecular force? What's the structure of glass? Well, glass has dipole-dipole forces of the silicon oxygen molecules on it, so it's like a polar sort of group of the silicates of glass. So you kind of have a mutual attractive force between the dipole-dipole force in water, um, the hydrogen bond in water, and those silicon SiO bonds. Um, and so you get a mutual attractive force Same thing with the plant stem having the uh, materials like sugars 
um, that attract the water. So you have a mutual attractive force of so the water flows upward and flows up the test tube, flows up the plant stem. Now, mercury actually forms a downward meniscus. And so this is what happens when you get repulsive forces between the liquid and the material. So mercury has more of a metal-metal bond. A metal-metal bond isn't as compatible with silicates as water is. So water is attracted to the silicate, so it forms the upward meniscus. Mercury is repelled by the silicate, so it forms a downward meniscus. And so just attractive forces, this is kind of shown here between the silicates and the water molecules having an attractive force. So you get the upward meniscus. And then here, the mercuries are being repelled by that charge on the silicates are being repelled downwards. We get the downward meniscus and repulsion. So our capillary um, action is directly proportional to mutual intermolecular forces. So having similar types of hydrogen bonding force or dipole-dipole force, or in the case of mercury, we'd want to have like a metallic metal that attracts those atoms to go upward. And so this is basically a summary of the main properties we talked about in this chapter that we can relate to intermolecular forces. So melting points, you strengthen intermolecular forces, you strengthen and raise the temperature it takes to melt a substance. So the stronger the force of attraction, of course, the higher the melting point, same with boiling point. So melting points breaking some of the intermolecular attractions, boiling's breaking all the others. And so our boiling point higher with stronger <coughs> forces we see the same trend with viscosity. So higher viscosity with higher intermolecular forces. The inward tension, the stronger the force of attraction, again, the stronger the, the amount of energy we have to apply to break a surface. So strengthen intermolecular forces, increase uh, surface <coughs> tension. And then it's just the mutual, having a mutual set of intermolecular forces will increase your capillary action. OK, so then there's, we'll talk about enthalpies of vaporization, fusion, and sublimation in a couple minutes. Um, those you can imagine that these should also be directly related to intermolecular forces. If we think about the enthalpy it takes to vaporize a substance, so let's think about like the water liquid to water gas reaction. That's our vaporization. That the enthalpy it takes to vaporize a substance should be related to the strengths of intermolecular forces. So um, for liquid to boil, if you recall that this is greater than zero, endothermic, meaning we have to put liquid water on the stove. We have to add heat to the liquid water to get it to boil. And so the amount of heat it takes the liquid to boil, its enthalpy vaporization, of course, is going to be related to intermolecular forces. So if you increase the forces of attraction, you should increase the enthalpies of vaporization. Same thing with fusion. Fusion is just solid to liquid. And the same thing with sublimation, which is solid direct to gas. So if you're thinking of, let's actually just write it without the substance being included. So if you have liquid to gas, if you have solid to liquid, and if you go solid directly to gas, these are all endothermic. And then they would all take more heat if there were stronger intermolecular forces involved. And then we'll see here in a minute, vapor pressure is the pressure above a liquid. So it's related to how many molecules escape the surface. Um, so you could probably imagine that if we have liquid A, liquid B, and um, we kind of smell liquid A, maybe like you waft some of it, you don't smell anything, and then you take compound B and it really smells very intense. Maybe you can even see fumes coming off the liquid. Those fumes are the vapors. And so do you think that the vaporous liquid at the same temperature as the, the other liquid, they're at the same temperature, do you think the more vaporous liquid has stronger or weaker forces? probably weaker force of attraction. That's why it's vaporizing. And so the weaker forces of attraction will raise our vapor pressure. So we'll see our vapor pressure is the one property here that's inversely related to intermolecular forces. So if we strengthen our intermolecular forces, 
We make it harder for a liquid to escape into the gas phase to escape into the vapor phase, and therefore will lower the vapor pressure. So vapor pressure goes opposite, but for a pretty good reason that vapor pressure is just related to how much gas had escaped the liquid, um, and more gas will escape the liquid, the weaker the forces of attraction are. So if we can weaken the forces of attraction, then we would raise our vapor pressure. So that's an inverse relationship. So let's get into some phase changes and look at some enthalpies of vaporization and fusion, and then look at some vapor pressures and try to understand those properties. And so this here is showing the sort of enthalpies of the systems for going from solid to liquid. So that is uphill in energy. Energy has to be absorbed to go solid to liquid, even more energy to vaporize. And so going upward is melting and then vaporizing from solid to liquid, liquid to gas. If we go back down, that would be condensation back to the liquid. Obviously, the sign would flip. So we have an exothermic reaction for gas to liquid. And then for freezing, liquid back to solid, of course, exothermic as well. And then deposition is the process from gas back to solid. And sublimation is the process for solid to gas. And so the solid direct to gas sublimation, um, uphill in energy, of course, energy is required. We get energy off exothermic for um, deposition. And so you can write that the delta H of, you can sort of see it here, the delta H of fusion plus the delta H of vaporization is equal to the delta H of sublimation. So our sublimation enthalpy is the sum of our vaporization and our fusion enthalpies. And so that's just if you just write gas to liquid, liquid to gas, from Hess's law, gas to, to solid directly would be the sum of those two processes. And so likewise, if you flip the reaction, you flip the sign. So if you go from flipping these endothermic reactions to being exothermic, you just flip their signs. To talk about one more thing before we move on, that when we melt a substance, we have to break some of the intermolecular forces of attraction. When we boil, we have to break all the intermolecular forces of attraction. So we often see that the melting is a smaller enthalpy than vaporization. So the vaporization, because we, ha we have to go from liquid molecules right next to each other to completely separated, greater amount of energy, breaking the solid forces just breaks some of those intermolecular forces of attraction. Compare a couple sets of enthalpy. And let's, so when we look in this slide here, we're comparing fusion vaporization and sublimation. You can see in each case they just sum together to be the, the sublimation is just these two fusions and vaporizations added together. And then you can also see that the fusion enthalpy relatively small compared to the vaporization enthalpy. And so now what we're comparing here is butane to dimethyl ether. So we're going from a nonpolar compound to a polar compound that, can hydrogen, that, that can't hydrogen bond, to water, which is polar but can H bond, and then to something that's not even, um, like mercury, where it just has a metallic bonding force of attraction, a completely different force than what we see in our molecular substances. And so what you can, can inspect from here is that having this oxygen here adds a little bit to our heat of fusion, heat of vaporization. Uh, the ether doesn't add a huge amount of polarity difference though in the molecule. Like if we add and change to water, uh, we're changing and not really comparing apples to apples with molecular weights really well on this particular slide. But we're seeing that we're increasing the enthalpy of vaporization through breaking that stronger H bonding force of attraction in water. And then the metallic bond though, pretty strong in the case of mercury. So metallic bonding, um, mercury is weird in that it's a liquid, but most of our other metals are solids, um, or all of our other metals are solids, having much stronger structures. Therefore, um, it's going to be harder to melt those substances due to having that stronger metallic bond. So the metallic bonding actually has bonds between the metal atoms in a way that our non-metals or uh, molecular substances don't have. So higher for mercury. And so this. Let's save them for the end of class. We've got, got to get through a couple slides here. Okay, so what this slide here is looking at is sort of the amount of heat it would take to change the temperature and actually go through phase changes. And so if you have a block of ice at some temperature, then to raise the temperature as ice, 
then that would involve like a, um, just an MCS delta T problem. This would just be, well, what is the specific heat of the item? What's the change in temperature we're undergoing? And so the heat it would take to add up our, our uh, ice from one temperature to another temperature would just depend on what's the specific heat of ice compared to, um, yeah, we'll see that the specific heat of ice is actually different than liquid water. So the specific heats of substances vary with their, their physical state. To go through the phase change process, we have to go through that delta H of fusion and add in the proper amount of heat for however much water is present to melt the substance. So to go from like zero degrees solid to zero degrees liquid requires energy that's determined by the enthalpy of vapor, or the enthalpy of fusion. And then likewise, once we melt, we now have a liquid at zero degrees C, we have to raise the temperature up to 100 degrees C. The next phase change point for water would be 100 degrees C. And then this would be, you know, zero degrees C liquid to zero degrees C liquid still, that this would be dictated by Q is equal to MCS delta T, where the CS is for liquid water. So we have like a, a delta T problem we're changing temperature with a given specific heat. And then going through the vaporization process, this is the one that takes the longest. Like if you're, at, if you're melting some ice, I, I guess it takes a while. So the, to melt, we have to wait for that energy to be absorbed by the, the ice to melt to liquid. And then if we heat up on a stove, um, it takes, uh, if, if you think of how long it takes just to come to boiling versus how long it would take to evaporate the entire pot of water, that's this process here. So you'd have to add in the enthalpy of vaporization for every component of the water for all the mass of the water to undergo that liquid to gas transformation. So that takes a fair amount of energy. So the energy it takes to boil water is, a, is like this difference of energy here, the, the energy it takes to completely evaporate a sample, a lot more energy. So our heat added is on the x-axis. So a lot more heat would have to be added to completely vaporize a substance into the gas phase. And so the problem would just involve a question like this of um, just, you know, how much heat it would take in order for a certain amount of ice to undergo a transformation is just by considering how much heat it takes to go through each of the steps. So if we have um, 100 grams of ice at minus 10.0 degrees C, how much heat does it take in order to fully va vaporize the substance at 100 degrees C? And so what this would mean is we have to go through kind of step one. We have to go from minus 10.0 degrees C to 0.0, .0 degrees C, and this would be using the specific heat of ice, which is 2.010 joules per gram Kelvin. It's about half of that of the specific heat of liquid water. So notice that ice has a different specific heat than liquid water. Uh, we're also given our vaporization and our fusion enthalpies here. And so this process here would just be the heat would be equal to MCS delta T, so it would be 100 grams of water. The specific heat for ice, because this is still ice here, 2.010 joules per gram Kelvin. And then our delta T is our final minus initial. So 0.0, .0 degrees C for the boiling point, or for the melting point. So 0.0, .0 minus negative 10.0 degrees C. So our delta T is minus zero minus negative 10, so it's uh, going up by 10 degrees C. So our delta T is plus 10 degrees C, so it takes heat, obviously, to raise this amount of water's temperature. So let's work this out, 100 times 2.01 times 10. And then ultimately, we're gonna wanna know this in kilojoules. So let's convert this to kilojoules. So 1,000 joules per kilojoule. So this is 2.01 kJs. So it takes two kilojoules to heat water from minus 10 to zero. Then we have to go through the the phase change. So we have to go from zero degrees solid 
to zero degrees liquid, in order to undergo this transformation, this is our fusion enthalpy. So for this, we have to take our Q is equal to the 6.01 kJs per mole of water, because that's our fusion enthalpy, and then we need to multiply this by the moles of water. Let's calculate that up here, so I don't have to do it in the problem. So I have 100 grams of water, 18.02 grams per mole of water, using its molar mass. So we have 5.55 moles of water present in that 100 gram sample. And so that's what I'm gonna multiply by here. So it's six times the quantity of water, or 6.01 times that quantity. So that's 33.4 kJs. So you can see already a lot more heat to melt the substance than it does to get it to the melting point. You know, so like this is why you know you have ice that's colder. You know, so your freezer is at usually zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so then you put it into cold water, it raises its temp or it, it, it lowers the temperature of water. But then the ice takes a while to melt because there's a lot of heat stored in frozen water. So the amount of heat stored here in this amount of water, 33.4 kilojoules. Okay, and so. Um, or there's a lot of ability of it to keep something cold stored in the cold water. Okay, so 33.4 kilojoules to go through the melting point. Then we have to go from zero degrees C to 100 degrees C to get up to the boiling point. So here our Q is equal to the mass of water times 4.184. And then our boiling point so 100 degrees, or we're starting at zero. No, we're, the final minus the initial, our delta is always here. Final minus initial, so 100 degrees C final minus the 0, 0 0.0 degrees C initial temperature. So our delta T is 100 degrees C. And then we're gonna convert to kilojoules as well. So 100 times 4.184 times 100 degrees C temperature increase, divide by 1,000 to go to joules, that's 41.84 kJs. which is a lot of heat as well. So it takes a while to take a pot of water and get it up to the boiling point. So this doesn't happen instantaneously, just like ice doesn't just melt instantaneously when you pull it out of the freezer. And so that amount of heat has to be absorbed by water. And then lastly, to convert to steam, we have to go from 100 degrees C liquid to 100 degrees C gas. And to undergo this transformation, we have to go through that vaporization enthalpy. And so that Q is going to be 45, or excuse me, 40.7 kJs per mole times the 5.55 moles of water. And this is the one that's really big. So 226 kilojoules. So 2.01 kilojoules to get up to the melting point, 33.4 to go through the melting point to melt the substance, 41.84 to get the substance up to the boiling point, and then 226 kilojoules to get through the melting point. So I get 268 total. So if I add all of these energies up, I get 268 kJs to go from minus 10 ice to 100 degree C vapor. Um, like I said, ordinarily you're not gonna 
vaporize the entire pot of water on the stove. Um, so usually you're not doing this transformation, but if you wanted to sit and wait for the water to come to a boil and then to completely vaporize, it's gonna take a lot longer to wait for it to completely vaporize due to the enthalpy of vaporization. Now, so this comes, that's a good question because it comes back to a topic out of chapter five that when we're doing delta T's, it's a change in temperature. So the change, if you convert zero degrees C to Kelvin, it's 273 Kelvin. 100 degrees C is 373 Kelvin. So your difference in Kelvin is 100 Kelvin. So your delta T in Kelvin is the same numerical value as it is in degree C. So when you give a, and when you see a joule per gram Kelvin, units on specific heat that this would be equal to joules per gram degree C. So we don't have to convert or double convert degree C to Kelvin. So joules per gram Kelvin is equal to joules per gram degree C because we're multiplying by a delta T. So delta T's in Kelvin are equal to delta T's in degree C. Is that not what it came out to? Um, Maybe I missed one. So 2.01 plus 33.4 plus 41.84 plus 226. Oh, 303, yeah. <laughs> you know, I do this example almost every semester, and I was even thinking that the 268 in my head didn't seem memorable. And the 303, I've done this calculation probably 10 times before. So yeah, yeah, good catch. I must have forgot or put it in wrong. Yeah, so we're just taking the 201, 33.4, and the 41.84, and the 226. Add it up. Okay, so then vapor uh, pressure, like, like where you can see this manifest, sometimes you see it in a coffee mug. So you, you fill your coffee mug, you seal it up, and then you shake it or whatever, um, and then you vent it and it hisses. And it's hissing because when you first fill your coffee mug with hot coffee, there's air in here that's at room temperature. So then you seal it up and then close the lid. What happens to that air in there? It heats up because of the, the hot liquid in there. So the air becomes higher in pressure. It becomes like, almost like an ideal gas law problem that the air becomes, uh, has a higher pressure because its temperature has gone up, its volume's the same. And then you open and release the pressure. You can hear the hiss. And so it's the same thing if you add something like ethanol to a flask. So you had ethanol to a flask where there's originally just air inside the flask that you, we had displaced some of the air when we filled it up with the ethanol, but the ethanol ends up vaporizing into the container. So ethanol has a vapor pressure. Most liquids have some natural vapor pressure. Ethanol is relatively high in terms of its vapor pressure. So we get some vapors in here so that our um, um, pressure is being added to due to the presence of that vapor pressure. And so in our container, we also have the hot water is vaporizing. So we're actually adding to the vapor pressure from water's natural vapor pressure from the hot liquid that we added to the container. So we're not just warming up the air in the container, we're, we're also adding to the pressure due to the natural vapor pressure of water at that higher temperature. So vapor pressure uh, releases, if we could increase the temperature of the liquid, then that would lead to an increased vapor pressure. So if you have a hotter liquid, it has a greater vapor pressure than a cooler liquid. So you can sort of change the vapor pressure with temperature. So vapor pressure is proportional to temperature. So you raise the temperature of the liquid, you raise the vapor pressure above that liquid. So more molecules can escape the surface of the liquid when Okay, and so this kind of comes back to temperature curves from chapter 10 of hotter Substances have more energy, more energy to break the surface of that liquid, hence a higher vapor pressure. Let's get back into vapor pressure, some different substances, and wrap up chapter 11, get into some topics of chapter 12 on Monday. All right, guys, that'll do it for today. Have a great weekend. I'll see you.